Well, Andrew, it's episode 200. <laughs> 200. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. And of course, that means it's divisible by 10. And you know what we do every 10th episode. Yep. That's the torture. And no, the Ask Andrew Anything. <laughs> torture yeah. Andrew. No, that's not as fun to say as Ask Andrew Anything. Well, it doesn't and have the same alliteration. <laughs> it's true. And this time, we've decided to bring in a few students a with few, us. yes. <laughs> or more than a few. More than or, a few. Or uh, quite a number of few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Multiples of few. Yes, yes. And so, of course, wherever you land, whether it be in California or when you were out in Locust Grove or now here, you seem to amass a group of students so that you can teach. It's addicting. <laughs> Just have to teach somebody something or else my mind turns to mush. Yes, especially now that you don't have children anymore I to know. teach. I know. Yeah, and all the grandchildren are pre-writing age, oh, at wow. least the ones around here. Yeah, your baby now works for us in customer service. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So pretty, pretty crazy. So we have asked these parents and students to come up with some questions for you. I don't think it was too difficult, but are you ready? It's Ask Andrew Anything. I, th I think I'm ready. Okay. Okay. I hope so. so. G give me the easy ones first. Mm, no, we'll save oh. those for the end. <laughs> okay. So does do any of our moms have questions for Andrew? Hi, Andrew. I wonder how to motivate and develop vision in children or students and if you were to go back and continue to develop vision for your children what would that be <laughs> how long is this podcast <laughs> right uh, well that is a very very deep and broad question that could require many hours of discussion um, most of which I would not be very qualified to answer. Uh, but I will give you just a, a few short little points on that. Um, the first thing is, I think over the years, I have discovered that that which is honored is cultivated. So when you see in your kids or your students something that is a good thing, then you want to honor that so that it will be cultivated more. So, um, you know, if you see someone making an effort in a certain way and you say, well, that's something that helps build their aptitude, ability, it's going to be motivating, then, hey, let's talk about how great that is and do more of it. I think we all like to hear the things we do well. We like to hear about that, think about that. Um, it's a little easier than hearing about the things we don't do well. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be one of the most important principles of motivation. Um, the second point would be um, exposure to positive influences. Um, occasionally, I get to do a graduation commencement speech. Um, which is usually rather short, uh, for which all the graduates are profoundly grateful. And one of the things I say to uh, kids moving from you know school into uh, workforce or college or university or some other adventure is now you get to start making decisions for yourself. And the most important decision is who you spend time with. And there's two categories of people you spend time with living people, and dead people. So visit cemetery. No. <laughs> um, the living people, obviously, are your friends and teachers and those that you choose to spend time with. And the dead people are the people who wrote books that you choose to read because that gets you in direct contact with them. And those seem to, I think, for most people, be the two most significant influences. So uh, as parents with children and you want to... Uh, inspire them, you want to try to cultivate certain values or virtues, then having those students exposed to people that you feel would help nurture that in them uh, is going to be, I think, critical. And then, of course, reading. You know, movies and music and other forms of culture have an impact, but a, a, a movie's impact is often much smaller than a book because you think about a book 
for a long time, right? Movies over, boom, you're on with life. Um, and then the, the friends you choose, the teachers you have an opportunity to be with. So I just tell them, if you ever find yourself in a group of stupid people, just leave. <laughs> Go find some smarter people. That's how you get smarter. So I don't know if that answered your question, but those are the two things that came to mind. Good. Another question for Andrew. Okay, Andrew, so if your student is maybe in the second year of doing IEW and they seem to really understand the concepts, is it okay to go ahead and skip some units or is there a reason they should do each unit in succession? Well, the units are put together in such a way that they um, build certain skills in a progression, which I think is pretty remarkable, almost like providentially inspired or, or I, I would say accidental, only I'm not sure there's ever accidents. But uh, there's a value in going through those units and there's a value in building mastery of the checklist that I do think you lose something out if you treat it more like a smorgasbord and say, well, you know, we'll do this and not do that because we like this, but we don't like that. Or, you know, well, we'll, we'll make this a suggestion rather than a requirement. That just doesn't seem to have the same long-term impact. So, you know, I generally say if, if you can stick with the system and work through it for three, four years, then you really have it solidly, um, you know, a solid understanding, a solid mastery. Then if they, you know, they go off to some other teacher or go take a class at a community college or go off to school or whatever, um, and some other teacher says, write this, write something, here's an assignment, they have that repertoire, structural models and stylistic techniques. They can pull the pieces and put it together and do a good job on that assignment, even though it's different than the system they've been working with because we're really equipping students with tools and then they can carry those tools around as long as they don't lose them. Good. Let me um, just interject something. We have written a blog post sort of about that, where if your student goes off to college or takes another class, what unit should they use to do a narrative essay? What unit is a uh, argumentative essay? So that blog post will be helpful. We'll post that in the show notes so that you can look at that too. Okay. Good. Another question. I was just curious, what is your favorite unit in the structure and style syllabus? And My favorite why? unit? I think, uh, well, you know. Unit six. Yes, unit six, uh, because I carry some of those scars from childhood of having to do that great research project with note cards and being overwhelmed with a pile of books and 100 note cards and no, no plan, no method, and just kind of floundering with that. And when I first saw the unit six, I thought, this is so elegant. It's so organized. Anyone can learn this. And then it creates a way of thinking and, and using information that's so tremendously helpful no matter where else, whatever you do. So, and, you know, when I look at the students who do it just the way it's taught and I see what they can do on their own and I think, you know, they're set. They're never going to be overwhelmed by research wherever they go, however, you know, high up in academic activity they get. So, yep, unit six for do, me. Do you know what I love about that that answer to your question? I think of these kids, and I wonder how many of you have actually done a report using note cards where you had to organize all the note cards like that. Raise your hand. See, maybe a few level C students, one or two level B, no one in level A. You have cured them of note card trauma. They will never experience they, it. They may have 11 by 17 <laughs> folded up paper trauma. It is true. <laughs> Good. Another question? Yes. Uh, as a homeschooling parent, what was your biggest parent fail, and what would you do differently if you could? <laughs> do we have to answer that? <laughs> well, it is ask Andrew anything. <laughs> but there doesn't say Andrew actually has to answer that. Okay. I, I will tell you. Um, it's maybe a little bit dated problem now, but I think parents in my generation about 10 years ago got blindsided by technology. And 
before we moved to Oklahoma, we had, I think, a very healthy situation with a couple computers in a little room right off the kitchen, hardwired in, and there was no wireless, and it had its place, and it was available and accessible. People could play games or do research, but it was controlled. And when we moved here, and they just installed a wireless router, and I didn't even ask for it, and boom, everything was wireless, and it happened so fast. Um, and with technology, if you any any privilege you extend, any freedom that you give to a child, you will probably never recover that. So I think parents want to be very judicious in how they extend that. So if I could go back and do one thing differently, 10 years ago, I would have said no thank you to a wireless in the house, kept the couple computers in a public hardwired space, and said, we will all suffer the inconvenience of this, mom and dad too, um, because once you go there, you can't go backwards, and then pretty soon everybody's just dispersed all over the place with devices, and uh, and then they're teenagers, and then it, it's really hard. So that would be the one thing I would wish different for, you know, it particularly affected my younger children more than the older ones. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Another question. We've been told that when helping our children that we cannot help too much. Can you elaborate on what would be too much help? Um, too much help. Mom, I don't want to do this. Okay, sweetheart, um, you go watch TV and I'll write your paper for you. <laughs> um, that would probably move into the category of too much help. But, you know, a, a lot of people question that statement that I made because they do wonder, you know, well, what would be too much help? And usually if a child indicates somehow, explicitly or implicitly, I need some help, I need a suggestion, I need a word, I need just you to sit here and smile at me while I suffer, um, I need chocolate milk, you know, whatever. <laughs> it, you know, if you can figure that out and, and provide that, then they'll continue momentum of success. Um, I think my point is the the world and the schools kind of operate like if you don't do it completely on your own, you're not learning anything, only that often doesn't work, right? So, um, you know, we, we say, okay, help as much as is needed, and you can't really help too much because at a certain point your, your child will say, okay, mom, I got it. Okay, leave me alone. I can do this. Just Goodbye. <laughs> right? But you can't predict when that will happen. So you kind of have to just wait till you build up a critical mass of helping, and then they'll tell you when they don't need help anymore. But you also have to remember the difference. There is a difference between helping and meddling. Meddling is when you come over and say, you know, I bet if you did it this way, it'd be a little better. Well, they didn't ask for your help. They don't necessarily want your meddling, and that's when they may get a little bit like, you know, kind of irritated or defensive or feeling even um, criticized. So, you know, it's always a balance. The virtue is always in the balance. Good. Good. Any other questions? What is the biggest word you said? <laughs> the biggest word that I said? Well, the biggest word I used to know is anti-disestablishmentarianism. But one of my students, named Navel, knows words that are twice that long. <laughs> and I don't know all the words she knows. And she puts them in her paper. So you, when you read her papers... I have to go <laughs> and find them. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, I need, I need to up my, my stock of really long words. Although, it's kind of irritating when students say, you know, can you help me spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? <laughs> and I'm like... I will help you spell it if you promise to put it in that paper <laughs> <laughs> appropriately. Good. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Out of all of the countries you visited, which is your favorite? Out of all of the countries that I have visited, um, I think Russia, uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, was perhaps the most interesting place that I've been um, 
I wasn't there for a long time, but it's probably the one place I would say I would most like to go back to um, because there's so much to see and the architecture and the churches and the museums and the kind of, you know, energetic spirit of the people in that city. Uh, so I'd, I'd say Russia. I have two questions. Um, when did you begin to love hot sauce? <laughs> <laughs> so when I was about your age, Lily, I was working as a busboy in a restaurant, and most of the other busboys in the restaurant were Mexicans, and they challenged me to a jalapeno pepper eating contest. <laughs> I did not lose, <clears throat> but I did suffer some consequences. <laughs> However, after that point, I guess I like burned some of those taste buds so I could just do more hot sauce. Um, and then it's kind of gone in waves. I can think of years when I didn't really have a lot of hot sauce or peppers, and then I would kind of get into it again um, and, and then after reading about the tremendous health benefits, uh, it's the secret of happiness and long life. And it's what there you go. And it's what you what you bring to our company potlucks. That's hot right. Sauce. Yes, yeah. a whole hot sauce buffet. Yes. from like wimpy little Cholula, <laughs> all the way to um, pure Ghost Reaper extract kind of thing. Yeah, he's got warning labels on that one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then my other question is, what did you want to be as a child? Oh, what did I want to be as a child? <clears throat> a lawyer, definitely. In fact, when I was about 10, my grandfather, who was a, uh, an accountant, had a set of law books, big, huge set, like 24-inch books, heavy, awful things. And he was going to throw them away because you have to keep getting updated law books all the time. So he gave them to me. So I put them on my bookshelf in my bedroom. And then I had my little desk. And then I had another little desk. And I had a typewriter. You've probably never seen a typewriter except maybe in an antique store. <laughs> but this was a true antique typewriter. Man, if I had it today, it would be worth $1,000. Probably or more. And then I had my law books. And I put on my desk a little sign that said, Andy Pudua, attorney at law. And I made my five-year-old sister sit next to me and be my secretary and pretend to type on the typewriter. <laughs> and I was just waiting for some client to come in and tell me that I needed to go to court and save their life. <laughs> um, but my interest in law decreased in my later teenage years. And I'm grateful. I'm profoundly grateful because I have since discovered that only – about 2% of all lawyers ever even walk in a courtroom, and all of the rest of them just have to read contracts and push paperwork, which I would hate. <laughs> so had I had determination to be a lawyer, I would be the most miserable person today. <laughs> but that was my childhood thought. If you had said, oh, you're going to grow up and be a violin teacher or a writing teacher, I <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't believe you. <laughs> What is your favorite dress-up opener and decoration? Oh, uh, my favorite dress-up is the strong verb. My favorite opener is the number four because it has all the nuances of invisibles. And my favorite decoration... You have to say alliteration. I would say alliteration, yes. <laughs> uh, even though it's not the most high and lofty one. Metaphor is the high and lofty one, but of course I'm not really high and lofty, so <laughs> alliteration, yeah. I have two questions. My first one is, what is your favorite book? My favorite book? It would have to be a book that I would read again mm -hmm. and again. Mm -hmm. There's probably a book that has had a greater impact on my life, but the one that I would probably read again and again is A Christmas Carol by mm -hmm. Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. I think I could read it every year. Um, and it's not depressing like a lot of books I read, like <laughs> 1984 or... <laughs> Brave New World. What is one of your greatest pet peeves? My greatest pet peeve? <laughs> I've become so mellow in old age. I really don't have too many pet peeves anymore. I don't, I don't know. Has anyone noticed that I have a pet peeve? <laughs> Frida, what, what would you notice? 
Hyphens, <laughs> yes. Yes. Hyphens, definitely. When you should be able to use one and editors tell you you can't. Yeah. Well, thank you, Frida. That that would qualify. Yes. All right. Hey, that's easy. You get someone to answer the other question. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. When was the last time you slept in? Yesterday. <laughs> yeah, actually, if I sleep in past like 6.30, that's sleeping in, generally. No, Jack's saying no. Sleeping in is what? Nine. I have two questions. Um, what is your favorite topic to write about? I don't like writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I'm forced to write something, what would I want to write about? Mm. Um, probably teaching structure and style, something I know something about. And how are you doing today? Today? It's a pretty nice day. I get to see all my favorite people in one single room mm -hmm. at the same time and have lunch. And there's no crises hovering about. So, hey, if it's not a disaster, it's wonderful. <laughs> Who is the most influential person in your life? Mm -hmm. Is or has been, living or dead? The most influential person living in my life today is my wife mm -hmm. because she gives me good advice and reminds me to keep my priorities straight and encourages me continuously. And she is the behind the scenes um, source of all success that I have had. If you were to have a second career besides being a writing instructor, what would it be? Oh, I love that question. If I could start another business, <clears throat> I would research the effects of music on consumption and buying patterns. And then I would go out to restaurants and stores, and I would try to consult with them to help them change their bad music into good music so that people would actually enjoy being in their store rather than being subconsciously irritated and people would actually want to stay in their restaurant and order more food than being subconsciously wanting to escape and annoyed. <laughs> because there's too much bad music in the world. Should I do that? No, you have another <laughs> job. <laughs> I have another job. Do you miss Corbin? <laughs> um, I, I do miss Corbin, although he's almost unrecognizable with that beard. Uh, however, you know, people come in and leave our lives, and sometimes when they leave, we just, you know, replace them with other people. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Corbin. Hello. How hot is the surface of the sun? I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's beyond my pay scale. Uh, somewhat related to the topic of beards, why don't you grow one? <laughs> I find beards very itchy. And I just to get from the point of no beard to a decent beard, going through that itchiness, I just find it kind of intolerable. Um, but I've had a mustache for so long, I can't imagine what it would be like to not have it. Yeah. Uh, but I just, I used to do beards like every winter, and then I just realized I hate this, so I quit. <laughs> but my wife keeps tempting me. However, she doesn't realize if I grew a beard now, it would be completely white, and that would be bad. <laughs> what was the longest paper you had to write? The longest paper I had to write? Are Gosh. you talking about in school or professionally? There's, I guess, any... I guess professionally. Well, so, so can I answer? That yeah, one? I think you know. Yeah, so oftentimes when Andrew is forced to write something, it's usually at my behest, and most of the time it's it's too long. Can you make that shorter? But there was one time that we let him write as much as he wanted, and that's in the book, however imperfectly, and it turned out to be seven thousand. Seven thousand, yeah. Or more? Or more words. So pages and pages and pages and pages. It was not an issue of write more. It was, oh, wow. <laughs> well, You've got a lot to say here. It was a one-hour talk that got written into, uh, written into an article for the book. But in school, I, don't, I have no idea. I don't remember anything really about school. <laughs> <laughs> and also, how often do you travel? Mm -hmm. uh, too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, 
probably in a normal year, I would be traveling or in a different city about 120 to 150 days. So a lot. Do you prefer Narnia or Lord of the Rings? That's like that Tolstoy or Dostoevsky debate right. that goes on. Yeah. Tolkien. And what books would you rec recommend for teenage boys? Mm -hmm. Tolkien. <laughs> yeah, Tolkien. Um, wow. Have you read Penrod? No. Penrod. Okay. P-E-N-R-O-D by Booth Tarkington. Thank you. Start there. Christmas Carol, obviously. Have you? Why did you choose to locate IEW in Oklahoma? <laughs> um, Oklahoma has a very good business climate. It's a business-friendly state. Property is relatively inexpensive compared to where I came from in California. Taxes are lower. People are nice. And it was just destiny. There was no way around it. <laughs> I tried a few other options, but all roads led to Oklahoma. And the weather is very interesting here. Yes. You know, in California, you can't really talk about the weather because it's always the same. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like camping? I used to like camping when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> I might like camping if I did it. Maybe with grandchildren some point. What is your favorite pastime outside of IEW? Well, I, I would have said a few years ago, I would have said teaching Latin, but I'm not doing that anymore because I don't have any Latin students. Cooking, I guess, is kind of my new thing. I'm really into cooking and hot sauce. <laughs> And I've been playing more chess and reading. I don't have, a like, a big hobby. When you have a, a business that you just pour your whole life into, it's not like you have another thing. Like, if you work at Walmart, you better have something else to do in your life, <laughs> right? Or else you're going to kind of be frustrated and bored. But when you have a, a business that's both your work and your passion, then it you know, the danger is you get obsessed with it, but uh, I don't really need a diversion. I love what I do. Um, what is your favorite tie? My favorite tie is a facsimile of the Book of Kells, which is one of the first illustrated manuscripts, uh, illustrated, illuminated, sorry, illuminated manuscripts of the Bible. And it's on display in Dublin, Ireland. And my wife went to see the Book of Kells in the museum, and she bought that tie. And it has kind of a, a medieval Latin script on it. And I would say it's not only my favorite tie, it is my most commented upon tie. You can be anywhere, like the supermarket, Starbucks, and people say, wow, nice tie. What is it? <laughs> so... If you could visit anywhere in the world, where would you go? Hmm. Where should I go? I, <laughs> I think next up on the list of places I would like to go to before I die would be the Holy Land. Mm. I haven't been to Israel, and I, I would like to go there. Um, there are parts of Africa I'd love to see, but my wife would choose... Um, the Holy Land before Africa, although we might squeeze in a little bit of Egypt or something. Mm. Uh, I just need someone to like call up and say, could we please get a writing seminar in Israel? <laughs> that would make it so much easier. Where do you purchase all of your ties? Where do I purchase all my ties? Oh, I don't purchase a lot of ties. Um, she bought me some ties. My wife had bought me some ties. My kids have bought me some ties. Um, I've stolen some ties. <laughs> no, I didn't really steal. I borrowed and just never had an opportunity to return them. Mm. Um, 
we should be clear, semantics <laughs> here. I've maybe of all the like 50 some ties that I have, I've probably only bought five of them myself. You know, it's good to have women in your life who have good taste. <laughs> Where do you find your jokes? Well, uh, various places. Uh, best thing is to find someone else who has a good joke, right? So, for example, I was at a convention, and there was a, a chemistry curriculum there, and this woman who had written it, and so I walked up to her and said, do you have any good chemistry jokes? And she said, oh, yes. I said, well, please tell me one. And so she said, well, two atoms were walking down the road, and one said to the other, I think I've lost an electron. And the other one said, really? Are you sure? And the other one said, yes, I'm positive. <laughs> so I'm just curious, what class heard that joke? Yeah, I thought that was a Yeah, beat. so, uh, <laughs> but that, uh, you know, that would be an example. Then I also, you can search for jokes online. And then I have like about that much of a bookshelf that's all joke books. So, you know, you can find good ones. Online jokes are harder because they're sometimes just not appropriate. Uh, and then sometimes you can take a joke and change it a little bit. So uh, it is. I have a talk called um, Humor in Teaching and Speaking, where I talk about the 10 things that actually make things funny. Because I was very interested to figure out, can you become more humorous if you want to? And I concluded, yes. It's a teachable, learnable skill. So good luck. <laughs> where do you get all your props? Mm -hmm. Props from the prop department. Right. <laughs> uh, well, we, we talk about it. We think, okay, what, what source text do we have and what could we come up with that would fit? And uh, so uh, we have some people who are particularly good at finding weird things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how many jokes do you know? I don't know how many I know or how many I can remember, but I have probably told at least 144 jokes in the last two years. <laughs> I have two questions. What inanimate object would you, if you could, eliminate from existence? What inanimate object could I eliminate from existence? Well, chihuahuas are not inanimate, so <laughs> <laughs> can't say that. Um, Gosh, that's a tough one. It's kind of like a pet peeve question. I know. I'd almost be tempted to say pencils, but they do have their place mm -hmm. in math. Mm -hmm. Bad books. <laughs> My second one is how many chickens does it take to kill an elephant? How many chickens does it take to kill an elephant? This sounds like a joke. Only one as long as the elephant is a real coward and is standing on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> so if you could live in any country, what country would you live in? I would live where my friends are. So that would be in the country I live in now. But I would be tempted to go live in Russia for six months just to see what it was like and try to learn a little bit of the language. Um, there's other countries I've thought might be nice to live here, but in the end, there's no place like home. <laughs> what is the silliest thing you've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad she didn't say stupidest. <laughs> that could be tough. Silliest thing? Hmm. I'm thinking they're thinking of the pirouettes and such things that you do in writing class. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably the most famous silly thing I've done is in one of the video courses that I did some time ago, there was an article about a jellyfish that would paralyze you in a very short period of time. And so I would, I would pretend to be paralyzed and then fall. I would collapse onto the table right in front of the students. And uh, so people all over the world have been watching me do that <laughs> for almost 20 years. 
Can you name all my siblings in 10 seconds? I can't name all your siblings even with an unlimited <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> but um, if you want me to do that, give me a list of all your siblings and I will memorize them. There's a door test. <laughs> we'll make it a door test. I, I, I do work harder on memorizing students' names, but siblings who aren't students, that's tough. Thanks, Eliana. How long have you been teaching? Teaching anything or teaching writing? Teaching writing. Teaching writing. Um, I learned this program of structure and style in 1990. How many years ago was that? Um, 28. 28. We're in 29, yeah. I learned it, and then I started teaching a little bit, and then I didn't teach for a while, and then I started teaching a little more, and then... I went full-time into Institute for Excellence in Writing in 1999. How many years ago was that? Um, 20. There you go. Been doing this full-time for 20 years. How old are you? <laughs> I was born in 1960. How old am I? 59. 59 is correct. I was tempted to answer younger than my wife. But... <laughs> Did you ever do any martial arts? And if you did, what belt did you get to? Oh, yes. Good question. I love martial arts. Uh, when I was uh, a teenager, uh, I started around 12. Um, I started in Shotokan style karate, and I got up to the first degree brown belt. And then I got distracted with other things like driving and working jobs and doing other things like almost grown up people. Uh, then, uh, when I went to Japan, I began to study uh, a few martial arts, mostly Aikido. I got a black belt there. I also studied um, a little bit of uh, Japanese sword work, Iaido. And I did study Japanese archery. And I even got a black belt in Japanese archery. Only here's the funny thing. You don't actually have to hit the target to get the black belt. <laughs> you just have to look really good in a black skirt and like have your body just perfect. Um, so uh, yes, uh, I would say that um, in my earlier life, doing martial arts was one of the most important and significant things that I did as a kid. What's your favorite number? Seven. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, did you like writing when you were a kid and why? I do not think I liked writing as a kid because I often had the problem of I don't know what to write about, so I would get that kind of overwhelmed frustration feeling. I believe that I started to like writing as a teenager when I had something that I knew about that I could write about. And I was very much into war games as a teenager. So I, I discovered, I discovered in my mother's file a newsletter hmm. that I created when I was like 17 years old. This was before computers. Yes. I <laughs> typed out carbon wow. copy, you go to the Xerox, <laughs> and um, it was called Conflict and Decision. And it was a newsletter about our war game group. Hmm. It's funny you find something that you did when you're 17 and you have absolutely no memory of having done it. <laughs> My second question is, when did you start playing the violin? I started playing the violin when I was five years old or just before. And uh, so I was one of the earliest uh, groups of kids to get Suzuki Method as a young child. And that was in Los Angeles. Seven? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many pets did you have? Pets? Do, you have? do I have now? Yeah. Zero. <laughs> Thankfully. <laughs> but w with kids at home, we've pretty much always had at least a dog and usually a dog and a cat and sometimes two dogs and a cat, sometimes two dogs, a cat and a bird. You know, and then if the cat gets the bird, then it's back to two dogs and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite kind of pen? My favorite kind of pen. Wow. Well, my favorite pen is a fountain pen that 
has the ink you can refill it. You've seen my pen. Yeah, that's my favorite. And if I don't have that, or if it runs out of ink, then a roller tip pen is my second. I don't like ballpoint pens too much. Two questions. First one, why did you start playing the violin? I have no idea. <laughs> my, my mother said that I was begging for a violin from the time I could talk. And she was a piano teacher. So I didn't want to play the piano. <laughs> Second question, what is your favorite spicy food? My favorite spicy food? Probably, oh gosh, they're all so good. That's like saying, what's your favorite type of chocolate? I mean, it's all chocolate, right? <laughs> Anything with beef and hot peppers, or lamb, or chicken. So I'm going to go back to that chocolate comment. Uh -huh. mm. no? Dark chocolate all the way. Right. Salty dark. Mm. Okay. Salty dark with nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just chocolate. <laughs> okay. I have two questions. Um what technology device would you eliminate from existence? Mm -hmm. Oh, what technology device would I eliminate from existence? Hmm. It's kind of like Elisa's question, only more specific. Hmm. That is a microprocessor that could be implanted into your brain. My second question is, would you rather... Um, what do you like better, um, The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings? Oh. Movies or books? Both. Well, the, no, the movies, the Hobbit movies were just awful. <laughs> um, the book, uh, probably, the, probably The Fellowship of the Ring, mm -hmm. of all four of the books, would be my favorite. Good. All right, well. We got through them all. That's a lot of questions. That's a lot of questions. I think that's a world record of how many questions that have been asked that you've successfully answered <laughs> all at once. So, well, thank you to everyone for participating in this rather unique activity. Well, I hope those of you that are listening to this podcast found some of these answers enlightening, amusing, perhaps helpful. <laughs> if you have a question, of course, we do try to spend some time every 10th episode in asking Andrew anything. Just email us at podcast at IEW.com, and we'll do our best to get those questions answered for you on the air. So thank you, Andrew, again for thank you, this time that we and had. And thank you to all the students and parents. Thank you to all parents. the students. Thank you. Thank you.